verses 4 through 6, the new heaven and the new earth. Let's all stand tonight and we'll read together out of verses 4 through 6. And the Bible says, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. Dear Lord, thank you for the reading of your word tonight. Thank you for how precious your word is. Tonight, Father, as we come to you, we ask you that you will help us to study together. Lord, give me the words that you would have us here tonight. Lord, I empty myself of me, and I ask that you fill me with your spirit. Preach and teach through me tonight, as only you can do. And Father, we'll praise you forevermore for what you do for us. You're such a good God. Thank you for what you've done in our services. Thank you for tonight. In your precious, sweet name, we pray these things in the name of Jesus. All God's people said, turn around and tell somebody you love them before you sit down there. Monday night we had our Appalachian Association meeting and it was over in uh, Irwin and I walk in the door and there Jimmy is. I said, Jimmy, what are you doing here? He said, I'm singing tonight. And uh, he was there with, um, what's, what was that group? What, I know y'all were together before. Greater Heights, yeah. And so they, they sang and did a wonderful job over there. And uh, I, we're just so blessed with all this talent in our church that uh, we can use and God has given us and uh, we have um, Jimmy's group and we have uh, the Hoods and we have Harold's group and then we have all these other singles that can sing and uh, God has just blessed us. We're so blessed and I'm so thankful. How about you? You thankful tonight that God has done that for us? Well, last, well, not last week, we had Bible school last week, but the week before last, we started this study of this new heaven and this new earth. We saw in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 2, verse 1 and 2, that it talked about there seeing a new heaven and a new earth and a holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from heaven. And we talked about that just for a little bit. The first thing we talked about is the appearance of this new heaven and this new earth. Found there in verse 1, where the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. When we talked about this part of the scripture and this part of the sermon, the phrase, a new heaven and a new earth, derives from two passages in Isaiah Isaiah chapter 65, verse 17, God declared, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. In the book of Isaiah chapter 66 and verse 22, For as the new heavens and the new earth which I make shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name Remain. We talked about that new heaven and new earth. We talked about not only the appearance of it, but the capital of this new heaven and new earth found in verse 2. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And then thirdly, last or a couple of weeks ago, Not only the appearance of this new heaven and new earth, not only the capital of this new heaven and this new earth, but the supreme reality of this new heaven and this new earth found in verse 3. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, 
And God himself shall be with them and be their God. What a wonderful verse. Actually, what we are talking about here is God will be with his people in the glorious presence of God in heaven. What will we do there, being in his presence? Well, I believe believers, as you and I, will enjoy fellowship with him, won't we? We'll see him. I know we haven't seen him. We've loved him, and we worship him, and we adore him. But one of these days, we will see him. Now, I don't know what you think about that or how you think about that, but it's truth. We'll be in his presence, believers. Those of us that love the Lord Jesus Christ will have fellowship with him, this imperfect, and that's who we are. This sin-hindered fellowship that we have now will become complete and full and unlimited when we get in heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that's going to be wonderful. Believers are going to see God as he is. 1 John 3, 2 tells us, Beloved, now we are the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he what? As he is. We're going to see him one day. No living person has ever seen God in his fullness of his glory. We can't look upon him in this body. It would kill us. His holiness, his majesty, his glory. We could not look upon him. But one of these days we'll be able to look upon him. Why? Because we're going to be brand new. We're going to be brand new. And we're going to be able to see him as he is. The third thing we talked about is that believers will worship God in heaven. You see, a lot of people think that we're just going to be up there and not really, you know, it's just a rest forevermore that we'll never do anything. I'm here to tell you that we will be busy in heaven. Worshippers will worship God, the Father in spirit and in truth. And by the way, it'll be perfect worship. We have not experienced that here on this earth. Perfect worship. But one of these days it'll be perfect. Because we'll be perfect. Now, I know we can't even imagine that. We can't even think of what that will be. But one of these days when we get to heaven, we're going to be perfect. Boy, that's going to be wonderful, isn't it? No more hindrance from the devil himself. That'll be worth it all. One of these days we will bow down before the Lord Jesus Christ and there'll be no more hindrance from the devil himself and we'll worship in spirit and in truth like we've never worshipped before. Now think about that. What a wonderful time in heaven that is going to be. And the fourth thing, believers will serve God. We're not going to be in heaven just to not do anything. There'll be things for us to do. There'll be... Uh, places for you to be and, and, and jobs for you to do. God has it all figured out. And the Lord will serve believers. The Bible says in Luke 12, 35 through 40, Verily, verily, I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them set down to meet and will come forth and serve them. But tonight, the changes in this new heaven and this new earth. We've read about it in verses 4 through 6. We, we're going to describe in just a moment what is totally beyond human understanding. We really can't understand everything that will happen to us in heaven and everything that we'll receive in heaven, but these things require us pointing them out. How they differ from our present time. How they differ from what we are right now. We do not know how this works. We don't know how God is going to do this, but we do know it will happen. You say, what are those things, preacher? Well, first of all, Revelation 21, 4, God says, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. I don't know how that's going to be one of these days that there's not going to be no more tears. We're never going to cry again. Now, you think about that. We're never going to cry again. 
Remember this now. I want you to understand that that does not mean that when we get to heaven that we will arrive there with tears and God will have to comfort us. That's not what that means there. But what it does mean is this. There's going to be an absence in heaven of anything to be sorry about. Now think about that. No sorrow. No more sorrow. I know we've all experienced sorrow. How many can say amen right there? We all have. There's never going to be in heaven no more tears because there's never going to be any misfortune anymore. We won't cry over lost loved ones anymore. I know many of mom and many of dad have been on their knees crying for their sons and daughters because they're lost and don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. And we help you pray for them. And we hope that they get saved before it's everlasting too late. We hope that they accept Jesus Christ. But folks, we all know that there's been people that have already left this world that didn't know Jesus. And as time goes by, every day, thousands upon thousands leave this world. And many of those folks leave this world without knowing Jesus Christ. And how sad is that? How sad is that to the moms and dads of this world and, and, and the brothers and sisters of this world? How sad is it to have someone leave this world without Jesus? But in heaven, there will never be a tear shed over someone that is lost ever again. No more tears. No more misfortune. No more sorrow. No more losing anyone to death. Secondly, not only will God wipe tears, uh, all tears from their eyes, but secondly, Revelation 21 4, uh, 4 says, there shall be no more death. No more dying. Isaiah 25 8 said, says, he shall swallow up death in victory. No more death. The greatest curse on this earth, and we all know this, and we've all experienced this, the greatest curse to human existence is the sting of death. But Paul said, it's going to be swallowed up in victory. Aren't you glad about that? One of these days we get to heaven, no more death. We'll be together forevermore. Never be separated again by, by, by death. Well, we ought to shout heaven down, amen? No more death. No more tears. No more pain. I've seen a lot of pain in my life. I, I've been in and out of the hospital now for more than 30 some years just going in and out and seeing a lot of people in pain. But Revelation 21.4 says in heaven, neither shall there be any more pain. I like what Isaiah 53, 5 says, But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. You see, what that's talking about there, a lot of people want to put that in the now and now, right now, that by his stripes we're healed, that we'll never have any more of this. But folks, while we're in this earth, how many of you know we're going to have pain? We're going to have these things happen to us in this earth. It's going to happen. And the older we get, the more often it's going to happen. But guess what? One of these days, by his stripes, we are healed. One of these days, we're going to have that ultimate healing. When's that going to be? That's going to be when we get in His presence. That ultimate healing one of these days. God has promised us that, and I believe it. How many believe that tonight? You see, on the cross, Jesus was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. He took our transgressions and our sins upon Him so that we could go free. And all those changes that I just talked about will mark that new heaven and that new earth. It indicates here that the first things have passed away. What does that mean, the first thing? That means all of human experience related to the original fallen creation is gone forever in heaven. Never more to return. No more mourning, no more suffering, no more sorrow, no more disease, no more pain, no more death. And all that's been characterized since the fall. 
since the Adamic nature came in. That's what happened to society. But God says in Revelation 21.5, Behold, I make all things new. This new heaven, this new earth, will be truly a new creation. It's not going to be just a refurbishing of this old earth. It's going to be brand new. A brand new earth, a brand new heaven, a forever new creation. They're going to be in this new heaven and new earth. No more decay. No more decline. No more destruction. You say, well, we look the same forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Yeah, you will. Amen. No bald heads. Is that right? He said that. I didn't. You shouldn't have made me say that. I'll get in trouble for doing that. No more, no more getting old. No more medicine. Amen. No more arthritis. No more cancer. No more strokes. No more heart attacks. No more doctors. No more funeral homes. Amen. No more. Because it's going to be brand new. The Bible says about this, about what I just said to you, about this no more decay and no more decline and no more waste. Revelation 21, 5 says, for these words, read that with me, for these words are what? Faithful. True and faithful, they are. And they are true and faithful. How many understand that? God is telling us that tonight. How many believe it? Amen, I believe it also. Now there's going to be an end to this universe, but... Not to the truth God reveals to His people. The majestic voice of the one sitting on the heaven's throne said to John in verse 6, It's done. And those words are reminiscent of what He said on the cross of Calvary. What did He say on the cross of Calvary? It is finished. What was He talking about there? The work that He had to do was finished. He was the ultimate sacrifice. He did what He came to do. And the same is said about our new home. It's done. You can believe it. You can count on it because it's true. Jesus' work is in completion of the work of redemption. Paul wrote about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 24 through 28. He said, Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom of God, even the Father when he shall have put down all rule and authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is what? Death. For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is a manifest that he is accepted which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued under him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. The fifth thing. The residents of this new heaven and new earth. Look at verse 6 and 7 of chapter 21 of Revelation. He said, I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of water of life freely. Verse 7, He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. There's really two descriptive phrases here that reveal who will live in this glorious new heaven and this new earth. The first one is, if you are a citizen of heaven, you're described as one who is thirsty, one who is a thirst. That phrase signifies those who recognize their desperate need for the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to ask you tonight, and I want to be honest with you, have you recognized in your life your desperate need for Jesus Christ? How many of you know tonight you need Him? I need Him. I can't live without Him. How about you? Now, we can let everything stand in our way, but tonight we need to get those things out because we can't, we need to thirst after Him. We ought to be thirsty tonight for the things of God. 
If your life can live without a thirst for God, then there's something wrong with your relationship to God. You've got to be thirsty for Him. What do you mean by that, preacher? I mean, there should not hardly be a day that goes by that you, can't get in, that you don't get into His Word because you're thirsty for Him. There shouldn't be a day in your life that you don't get on your knees somewhere and, and pray and talk to Him because you're thirsty for Him. It's that personal relationship with Him that you thirst for Him. Is everybody with me? Are you thirsty tonight for Him? Because these are the ones that will be citizens of heaven. Listen to what Matthew chapter 5, verse 6 says. It says they're hunger and thirst after righteousness. They are the same ones whom Isaiah cries out in Isaiah 55, 1 when he says this, Everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. And he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Thirst after the Lord Jesus Christ. Thirsty for Him. Those of us who will be redeemed and enter heaven are those who are dissatisfied with this hopeless lost condition of this world. Sin ought to bother Christians. Does it bother you? The sin of this world? Do you long for something better? Boy, I do. I hate sin. I hate the sin of this world. Am I a sinner? Sure I am. Do I sin? Sure I do. But He is my Savior. He forgives me. I hate sin, don't you? I hate it with a passion. I hate what it did to Him. And it's still, you know, as we sin, those of us that are going to heaven, we've craved God's righteousness in our life. We want Him in every part of our being. That's who we are. We thirst after Him. The, thought, the psalmist expressed this in Psalms 42, 1 and 2, and I love these verses, some of my favorite verses. As the heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after Thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God. For who? The living God. When shall I come and appear before God? In other words, what he was saying, I thirst after you. I, I, I want you more and more every day. And one of these days, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to come before you. And how many of us know that tonight? That that's our destiny as Christians. That's what's going to happen. The promise that we ought to be earnest seekers that we ought to thirst, that we need to be satisfied through the drinking of this salvation that God has given us, this thirst that we have for Him. In Revelation 21, uh, verse 6 here, it says this, I will give unto Him that is the thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. You remember when He went to the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well? Jesus promised in uh, John 4, 13 through 14, here's what he said. Jesus answered in verse 13, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. That's what God is talking about there, salvation, that your salvation is always springing up, that your salvation is always alive in you. Let me understand that. Praise His holy name. His, his salvation, the change that He's created in us. It's the same water that He spoke of in John 7, 37 and 38 when He said, In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto Me and drink. He that believeth, there it is, He that believeth on Me, as the Scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow what? Rivers of living water. Praise His holy name. Secondly, 
Not only if we're going to abide in this new heaven and new earth are we thirsting for it, but also the Bible says in verse 7, he that overcomes or the overcomer. What does that mean to be an overcomer? What is God talking about there? Well, 1 John chapter 5, verses 4 and 5 says this about overcoming. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. In other words, if you're saved, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, this old world, listen, this old world is in the destructive mode. How many understand that? This old world's going down. It is. But God says if you're in Him, you're an overcomer. You've overcome this world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world. What is it? Our faith. Our faith in Jesus. Our faith knowing He's real. That He's going to do exactly what He said He's going to do. Who is He that overcometh the world? But He that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. That's who overcomes. Is that you tonight? The promise here is to those that overcome. Verse 7 says, if we overcome, we shall inherit all things. You and I have an inheritance tonight in heaven with Jesus. You say, how do you know that? Because he tells us that. In verse 7 he said, we're going to inherit all things. You see, on this earth, these things that we have here are perishable, but one of these days, we're going to inherit the imperishable. We're going to inherit the undefiled. Uh, we're going to inherit the things that won't fade away. We're going to inherit those things that are reserved for us in heaven tonight, right now. That's what we're going to inherit. Well, I tell you what, you've got a great inheritance. Somebody said the other day, I don't have anybody that's going to leave me any kind of inheritance. Listen, folks, with what Jesus has for you, you don't need no inheritance. Amen. He has everything we need and more. <laughs> you have an inheritance, all right. And it's with Jesus. And it's forevermore. It's reserved for us in heaven and this promise is to every one of us who are overcomers, who thirst for righteousness. Verse 7 said that he gives us another promise there. I will be his God. I will be his God. They're going to inherit all things and I'm going to be his God. And then he said, gives us another promise in verse 7. And he shall be my son. The sixth and last thing tonight. The outcast from this new heaven and this new earth. Look at verses, or verse 8. Now listen. Here's who will not be in heaven. But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and liars shall have their part in the lake of fire which burneth in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the what? Second death. You see, John concludes here the overview of this new heaven and this new earth with a solemn warning. He's always teaching us. Even in our happiness and even in telling us what heaven is going to be, he brings in this part of those that will not be there so that we will be witnesses while we're here on this earth. That's what you are. Your job as a Christian while you're here on this earth is to be a witness. How many understand that? We are to be a witness to those that are lost. What's he say here about this witness? Well, he concludes with this overview and it's a serious, solemn warning. He talks about those who will be excluded from any participation in this blessing of heaven. He says all the unforgiven and unredeemed sinners. Look at the first group, the fearful. These are the ones that are cowards. You say, what do you mean by that preacher? These are those who lack endurance. They fell away. Their faith was challenged. 
Jesus describes such people in a parable of the souls. And if you look there in Matthew chapter 13, verses 20 and 21, here's what it says. But he that received the seed into stony places the same is he that heareth the word. The key word there is stony places. The seed didn't get down deep enough. How many of you understand that? And when Jesus saved us, listen folks, you, you knew you were saved. He changed you. Amen? You're not the same anymore, right? You've never been the same since you got saved. The key word here is stony places. Those places where the seed didn't go down deep. And it says here, they heard the word. And anon, that means and at once, with joy and received it. In other words, they, in a flippant way, they hath not a root in himself. They heard the word. They said they received the word, but there was no root. They really didn't get it. Amen? And how many of you know there's a lot of folks do that? A lot of folks. We've got to be careful about that. We've got to make sure we tell people what it means to be saved. Be truthful with them. Listen, folks. Listen to me. The gospel cuts. The gospel sometimes hurts. Sometimes the gospel will hurt your feelings. Amen. But it's got to be preached. The truth has to be out there. And people have to accept the truth for what it is. The truth. And if they don't, then they're not saved. Is everybody with me? Then they don't know the Lord. And here are those very ones that, that, that thought they had a relationship, that, that thought that they came to the altar, or thought that they sung in the choir, or thought that they taught a Sunday school class, but they still wasn't saved. It's those that do not know Him. Secondly, the unbelieving. They don't have a faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. They never have, never will. And the Bible says those are those that will die and go to hell. The abominable, what are those? Who are those? They're the ones that's caught up in wickedness and evil. They're doing things that they know is wrong. You can see it. You know it. You're praying about it. It's those sons and daughters are in things they shouldn't be in. And you know it. And they know it. It's wicked. It's evil. They're not right with God. And God said they will not go to heaven. Murderers. Whoremongers. Sorcerers. Idolaters. And liars. Now, folks, I'm here to tell you tonight, these folks, the Bible says, will not go to heaven. These are those that their lives are characterized by such things as give evidence that they're not saved, that they do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, that they've never known Him. The Bible says in verse 8, And they shall have their part in the lake, which burns with the fire, and with brimstone, which is the second death. Now, we may not preach that from our pulpits today and, and at this hour, but it still doesn't change the truth, the fact that it's truth. The truth of the matter is right now, as we enjoy our comfortable church, and we listen to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, that right this very moment, there are people in hell tonight. It's truth. And God said these folks will not go to heaven. These folks will not enjoy this new heaven and new earth. It only awaits those believers, those that have been saved those resurrected uh, believers. It'll be a home of eternal happiness for us. We'll dwell there forever in the glory pre glorious presence of God. 
But unbelievers, unbelievers, this place called hell is a terrifying place. It's a place of unbearable torment. But the worst thing about hell tonight is that it will be a place away from God. Never more again will those folks that die and go to hell, never more again will their heart be touched by God. They will never hear from Him again. God says heaven's real. It's real. And we're going. If we're saved. Thank you Lord Jesus for tonight. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for everything you do for us. Thank you for your precious word. Your word is truth. You may be here tonight and you're praying for somebody. We will allow you to come tonight if you'd like to pray at the altar. We'll just wait just a moment on you.